Johnny Dollar. Lucian Peterson here. Luke, how are you? Just fine, Johnny. How are you? Still out there in dear old Seattle, Wash? Yep. And still holding down a job with Western Maritime and Life? Sure am. Or let's say I'm trying to, but at the <laughs> rate we've been paying off on claims lately on some of my own clients, well, the home office doesn't like me too well. Something phony about some of those claims, maybe? No, but they've all been big ones. Half a million here, a quarter million there, 600,000 just last week. No wonder the company doesn't like it. So right now, I don't want to have to pay off on Mrs. Myra Brittingham. That is, if I can help it. Well, I don't know Myra Brittingham or anything about her, but uh, if you've insured her and she is now dead... That's just the point, Johnny. She isn't. Hmm? Not yet. Oh? But maybe somebody would like to see her that way? Well, I don't know, but I think so. Or maybe this hunch of mine is all wrong, Johnny. And I'll be the first to admit it, that this feeling, this worry of mine, is nothing more than a hunch. If I were to tell the police about it, they'd probably laugh in my face. Well, I don't know, Luke. I've had some pretty wild hunches work out for me more than once. I know. That's why I've called you. And I hope you can fly out here and, well, see what you think. See if you think he's liable to try it. He? Yes. Who? Her husband, Mark. Oh. Yeah. Well? Sure. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Seattle, Washington office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Chuckanut matter. Expense account item one, six dollars for a cab out to Bradley Field. Item two, 18670 plane fare. It was after 11 p.m. by the time we set down at Seattle Tacoma International. So item three is five and a quarter for a cab into the Benjamin Franklin, where I proceeded to get me a good night's sleep. Then after a hearty breakfast the next morning, I dropped in on Lucian Peterson. Now, Johnny, you're staying at the Ben Franklin? That's right. And that's where I'll have him deliver a rental car for you. You can repack your bags, toss them in, be on your way. Oh? To where, Luke? The little town of Chuckanut. Where is that? Well, you know where Bellingham is. Yeah, it's about 85 miles north of here. And Chuckanut's five, six, seven miles this side of Bellingham. Oh. And that's where Mr. and Mrs. Brittingham live, hmm? Well, just this side of it, off Chuckanut Drive, is uh, Paliup Lane. <laughs> a narrow, badly paved road that'll take you up into the mountains. Be real careful of that road, Johnny. And if it's wet when you get there, be doubly, triply careful. Why you say that, Luke? That dinky little road has more twists and kinks and switchbacks than you ever saw in your life. Miss one of the turns, and you'll end up either flying off into space or smashing into the face of a cliff. Well, I remember that. But tell me, uh, what's going on between the Brittinghams? Well, to begin with, they're both heavily insured. As a matter of fact, 500,000 bucks worth apiece. Wow. Yes, and they're insured in each other's favor. I see. Mark Brittingham is about 35, Johnny, and all his life he's been nothing but a playboy and a sportsman. Mm -hmm. Living first on the money his father gave him, and now on the insurance left him by his last wife. Oh, then Myra's number two. Myra's number four. Oh. And Johnny, I'm as sure as I am that I'm sitting here that the only reason Mark married her is because she had one of those incurable diseases. Only a few months to live type of thing. I see. Yes. Then modern medical science, not long ago, suddenly, unexpectedly, found a complete cure for it. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Luke, did his former wife die of some incurable disease? Well, that's what the police and company investigator and the court decided. Johnny, I've always suspected that he somehow helped the old biddy on her way. Now you think he wants to do the same for Myra, so he can collect on her insurance, right? I do. Do you have any concrete evidence, Luke? Well, it's no secret that Mark and Myra haven't been getting along lately. Things have been pretty tense between them. Why? Well, Myra's five or six years older than he is. Still a very attractive woman, Johnny, believe me. But she's older than he is. Mm -hmm. Also, that woman has more expensive tastes than anyone I've ever known. In other words, instead of dying off like he thought she would and leaving him a lot of money, all she does is spend it for him. I see. 
So instead of having plenty of dough for the racetracks and nightclubs and parties and so on, he's having to reef in his sails. The only way he can ever get together a sizable hunk again is by having her dead. Well, you think he'd go so far as to kill her? If he can get away with it, yes. Because evidence to the contrary notwithstanding, Johnny, I still think that's what happened to the last one. Well, if he should, I mean, he'd never collect the insurance. If we could prove it. Well, yes. Well, what am I supposed to do, Luke? Go up there and scare him out of it? Why not? <laughs> that's a new one. I know. As I told you on the phone, this is really all just a hunch on my part. But I think it has a pretty solid basis. Look, suppose you go up there. Just see him on the pretense you're interested in buying that property. Oh, is it for sale? Well, he wants to sell it to raise some of that green stuff he loves so much and that he's rapidly running out of. Just spend a couple of hours talking about their house and property. Now, listen, Johnny. And then just let it slip out who and what you really are. What? Huh? Sure. If that doesn't convince him he's under suspicion, make him change his mind about trying anything, I'll eat my hat. Will you do it? Okay, Luke. As long as you're paying the bill. Good. But I still don't think that you have any real... Well, we'll see. The weather was clear, and the drive up to Chuckanut was a pleasant one. But that little side road leading up to and around the edge of a mountain toward the Brittingham Place was anything but... A couple of times on an outside turn on that tortuous, narrow asphalt, I could catch a glimpse of the house, far above and nestled in among the trees. But most of the time, I was too busy watching the road. Until suddenly, as I rounded a particularly sharp, tight outside turn... Oh. Hey, watch it there! Directly in front of me was a police car. In front of that, smashed head-on into the face of a cliff, was one of the new compacts. The whole front end of it bashed in. Well, now, mister, who might you be? How are you, Lieutenant? Only it's Sergeant, Police Sergeant Bill Foreman. Oh, Sergeant? Well? My name's Johnny Dollar. What? The insurance investigator? That's right. Well, I'll say this. It sure beats me how you found out so quickly. Found out about what? That stiff in there in that car that smashed up. Stiff? Who, Sergeant? One of those crazy Brittinghams that have been tearing at each other's throats for so long now that one of them just plain had to go. Which one, Sergeant? Not much question about that, Dollar. Go take a look. All right. Yeah, Dollar, that's Mr. Mark Brittingham. What's left of him? Mr. Brittingham. Hey, you sound surprised. Yeah, yeah, I am. You know him? No. Oh, his wife then? No, no, Sergeant. I, uh, I never met either of them. How did you find out about the accident? Uh, I got a call from his wife, Myra. Said Mark's been away for a while. He wouldn't be back until sometime early in the week, so she was all alone. Yeah. Said she was sitting up there on the porch. Uh, you notice the porch that sticks out the side of their house up there, darling? No, it's so far away, and I was so busy driving that... Go on. Well, when you walk back to your car, there on that outside curve, maybe you can see it. Anyhow, she caught glimpses of a car coming up the road. Whose it was, she didn't know. And, well, her being alone, she didn't want any prowlers around, so would I come take a look? So? Well, I told her I was busy. Maybe it was just a special delivery or something, but then she hollered, oh, my goodness, it sounds like there's been an explosion down there on the road. So I came on up here. She didn't recognize the car? This morning sun right in her face. And the car only showing itself now and then on those outside curves. Well, just take a look at that sun. Ah, I see what you mean. So it wasn't the sun in Brittingham's eyes that caused this wreck? No. The sun was directly at his back as he came around that last hairpin. But, Dollar, I always warned him about the way he'd come tearing up this twisty little stretch. That is, until he made me ride with him one day to prove his point. What do you mean by that? Well, he used to be a racing driver. Sure, sure, he had me hanging on for dear life a couple of times. <laughs> oh, <that. laughs> and I'll tell you this, Dollar, he could really handle that wheel. Anything made him crack up this way, uh, wasn't himself. 
Must have been something gone wrong with his car. Mm. Well, if that's so, it's going to be pretty hard to prove, Sergeant. <laughs> considering no. the way it's smashed up. Don't be too sure about that. You ever hear Mr. Hartford Homer Ransom? The sudden death detective, they call him. Hartford? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Greatest reconstructor of traffic accidents that ever lived. So I understand. Yeah. Well, he lives just the other side of town. You give him maybe an hour or so with his wreck, and he'll tell you just exactly how it happened and why. Just as though he'd been standing right here watching it. Well, then maybe you talk don't... about Sherlock Holmes. Oh, why, Mr. Ransom can look at a set of tire tracks or a even a couple of pieces off an accident, and he'll reconstruct the whole thing. Just like that. I tell you, sir, it's uncanny. Hmm. Well, Sergeant, uh, you better get him up here to look at this. I'll do that. Also, I think you better have your coroner look at Mr. Brittingham's body. And, and uh... Yeah? Well, what is it, darling? The way that he apparently threw his right arm up in front of his eyes just before the crash. You notice... Yeah. Well, sure, in the hopes of patting himself when he hit the windshield. A former racing driver? Instead of slumping down, relaxing? Anybody would. I wonder. Well, now, tell me this. Wouldn't you put up an arm? I mean, seeing that wall of rock coming straight at you? I don't know. Well, I do. I know I would. Wouldn't you have had both hands tied on the wheel going around that turn at the speed he must have been going? No. Maybe so. But he put his arm up. And that's what puzzles me. Because he must have done it while he was taking the curve. That outside curve. Yeah, well, I don't know. But now we better get up there to the house and give Myra Brittingham the bad news. I'll tell you what, Sergeant. Yeah? Let me go up there and tell her. Meantime, you get this man Ransom on the job and have a medico do an examination of the body. And I mean a thorough... No, 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 no. Wait a minute. You think maybe this wasn't just an accident, Dollar? I didn't say that. But that's what you meant, isn't it? Let's wait and see. Hmm? The Brittingham place, built there on the side of a mountain among the trees, was quite an establishment. New, modern, and very expensive. As for Mrs. Brittingham, Myra, well... Lucian had said she was about 40. She didn't look it. She was five foot three or four, brunette, with an almost olive complexion, very dark eyes, and the kind of natural beauty that you seldom see in a figure to go with it. I introduced myself and made no bones about my connection with the insurance company. Before I could tell her why I was there, she led me out onto the little porch where, looking out against the sun, I could see occasional spots on the road I'd just driven up. And then, calmly, and with a self-control that I hadn't expected. Was it Mark, Mr. Dollar? I'm afraid so. He's dead, isn't he? Yes. Well, I knew it would happen sometime. I warned him over and over about the way he drove so madly up and down that crooked little road. In spite of the fact he'd driven expensive racing cars when he was younger. I knew he'd kill himself sooner or later. And now he has. I'm sorry, Mrs. Brillingham. Are you? I'm not. What did you say? It rather settles things, doesn't it? Does it? We uh, hadn't been getting along, Mark and I, for quite some time. And I know it was partly my fault. Why do you say that? Because of money, Mr. Dollar. You see, I married him for his money because I thought that for the rest of my life he'd be able to give me all the things I'd always wanted. Yes, Oh, it was all great fun with him while he still had it. The big parties night after night, the racetracks all over the country, theaters, nightclubs. I even put up with his silly hunting and fishing up here. But when the money began to run out and we had to sell the big home in Bellingham and the cars and get rid of the servants and settle down in this little place, I've hated this place, Mr. Dollar, and I hated him. We fought like spoiled, hysterical children. Mm. But you see, when he knew the money was getting low, well, 
If he had any gumption, he'd have got himself a job of some kind. For once, he'd have had to work for a living. But instead, he only got moody and drank a lot. Acted very strangely. Began looking at me in a peculiar, frightening kind of a way. Oh? And then, because of something he said one night, I began to fear him, what he might do. Go on, Mrs. Brittigan. Oh, I, uh, I know Mr. Dollar. He was upset that night because we'd had another argument, a terrible argument. And he'd had too much to drink. But he started laughing to himself, quietly chuckling to himself. And then he, uh, well, he tried to say it lightly, as though he might be joking, but he said... Yes? He said, wouldn't it be nice for him if I should die, like his wife before me had? Hmm. And then he could get a little fun out of life again, on my insurance money. It frightened me, Mr. Dollar, terribly. Well, I can't say I blame you. And then these long trips and leaving me alone like this. Trips to where, do you know? No. Oh, I've wondered if he hasn't been out looking for someone to take my place. Or just planning some way to, uh... Well, it's all over now. Well, I'd lie to you if I said I was sorry. You know, of course, that you stand to collect some half million dollars of insurance. Yes, I know. And I'll use it to, uh, get as far away from here as I can... Can you blame me? I want to talk further with you, Mrs. Brittingham. Of course. First, though, I'd better check out the police report on this accident, purely as a formality. Of course. So if you don't mind... I'll be here, Mr. Dollar. Why paint herself so black to me? To impress me with her honesty? So I'd dismiss any thought that she might have somehow had something to do with the accident? And another thing, a little thing, her sudden alarm when she'd seen that car coming up the road, even if she couldn't recognize it against the morning sun. Was that enough to call the police? Something wrong here, something very wrong. In the United States today, there are more than six million children under the age of 18 who live in homes where there is no father. Among them are hundreds of thousands of boys who need the guidance and interest that large-hearted men can give them. They can be set on the path toward fine citizenship through the Big Brother movement. Now, at the beginning of Big Brother Week, find out what you can do to help expand this valuable program in your community. Contact your local Big Brother organization or write Big Brothers of America, Philadelphia 3, Pennsylvania. It was early the next morning at police headquarters that I met with Sergeant Foreman, Dr. Hugo Bascom, the coroner, and with Mr. Hartford Homer Ransom, who knows more about the basic laws of inertia, matter, and motion than anyone I've ever seen. He can read a set of tire marks like an expert tracker reads a trail, and more important, he's an expert on human reaction times. But the one thing I don't understand, Mr. Dollar, is his right arm up over his eyes that way. Hey, that's funny. That's what Dollar said, too, Mr. Ransom. Seemed to me, though, he was trying to protect himself against the windshield frame. Have time to take one hand off the wheel after pulling around that turn at that speed? No, Sergeant. So he must have raised his arm to that position. While he was on the outside of that curve, which simply doesn't make sense. Mm. Not at the speed he was traveling. And like I said, he wasn't shading against the sun because the sun was at his back. Do you suppose a good-sized bird or some kind of animal had dashed across in front of him and... Might he have done that involuntarily? A man with racing experience on a turn like that? No, Mr. Dollar. It would have to have been something... Something like... Like what, Mr. Ransom? I don't know. I don't know. And there was certainly nothing wrong with his car. You're sure of that? I'd stake my reputation on it. Well, there was certainly nothing wrong with him, Mr. Dollar. You did a complete autopsy, Dr. Bascom? I did as thorough an autopsy in Mark Brittingham's body as I've ever done. There was absolutely no, no physical reason for that accident. Mm -hmm. uh, you checked for alcohol in his bloodstream? I checked everything. And what's more, incidentally, I know that Mark's general condition was perfect. I myself gave him a complete physical less than two weeks ago. 
So if you're thinking about a, a temporary blackout or something like that, well, there's no reason for it. Well, I wasn't, Doctor, but can you be absolutely certain that that isn't a possibility? In my job, Dollar, and I mean as coroner, I would have to find actual evidence of such a thing before I could put it on record. No, there's only one conclusion that we can reach here. Suicide, Dr. Baskin? Suicide, Mr. Ransom. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't agree with you. No, you can't, eh? Why not? Well, for one thing, the tire tracks. Had he crashed into that rock wall deliberately, the tracks would have gone straight to it. As it was, they were quite erratic for the last 81 feet. I'm putting it down as suicide. Also, that, that position of his arm, as though he'd brought it up to shield his vision against the sun. And the sun being at his back. That doesn't make sense, and you know it. I say it was suicide, and that's the Wait way that I... Wait a Wait a minute. Maybe it was the sun. That's impossible, Dollar. Of course it is. Ridiculous. Is it? Ridiculous. Dr. Baskin, before you file your report, I'd like time to play a little hunch. A hunch? Yes, maybe it's a pretty wild one, but there's one thing that could possibly have made him take his hand off the wheel on that curve and made him raise up his arm that way. Are you still harping on that, young man? I'm still harping on that because if this hunch of mine is right, Mark Brittingham was murdered. It murdered? Sergeant. Yeah, yes, sir? I want you to drive up to the house and bring Myra Brittingham down here. Yeah, well, uh, but why? Any excuse you can think of to look over these gentlemen's reports or something, but make it good because she's smart. Then when I call you on the phone... Where will you be? When I call you, drive her on back to the house. And listen, when you get to that curve, take it slowly. Just crawl around it and with one foot on the brake. Well, now, look... Unless you, you want to end up the way Mark Brittingham did. <laughs> the sergeant got her away from there, I went over that house top to bottom. Sure, there were mirrors on the bedroom walls, big clumsy ones, a couple of hand mirrors too on her dressing table. But the kind I was looking for would be in among her husband's fishing and hunting equipment. I found the survival kit all right, and in it were the usual, the water purifying pills, some iodine, salves, bandages, a couple of cans of sea ration. But the little mirror was missing. I mean the kind that's used for signaling, a small, clear, oblong mirror with a hole in the center. By facing the sun and peering through that hole, you can aim it. You can focus the full rays of the sun on anything up to a mile away. And then I found it, tucked between the pages of a book on a table out on the porch, where she practiced with it and then used it as a murder weapon. I called Sergeant Foreman and told him to drive on up the hill, but slowly. And then as he poked his car around that crucial curve, as I aimed the mirror to reflect the blinding rays of the sun full into his windshield, well, fortunately, he was able to stop before losing control. He waited there until I drove down to meet them. Then... No, she hasn't said a word, Dollar, since I jammed on the brakes and raised up my arm to cut off that glare you shot down here. I see. Well, Myra... How did you know? How did you know that's the way I killed him? I didn't. It was purely a hunch, I guess, but... it looks like it paid off, doesn't it? $500,000? That's a nice round figure. A lot of money. But don't they ever learn that even millions aren't enough to murder for? Expense account total... Oh, call it a nice round figure, like, uh, say, um, $391.18. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I'll be back with another exciting adventure that'll really surprise you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Joan Ellison as Myra Brittingham, Robert Dryden as Sergeant Bill Foreman, Richard Kendrick as Luke Peterson, Bernard Lenro as Hartford Homer Ransom, and Ivor Francis as Dr. Hugo Baskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking.
Get the news firsthand and in full from expanded CBS News on the CBS radio network. Hello there. This is Kelly Maddox, Executive Secretary of the Citizens Traffic Commission. And here is our safe driving tip for today. You know, there's a lot of confusion on the part of motorists and pedestrians as to what a flashing red light means. A flashing red light, when used as a traffic signal, means that the motorist must come to a complete stop before entering an intersection and after stopping proceed only when it is determined that the coast is clear. This same rule applies to pedestrians. The Citizens Traffic Commission would like to impress on all motorists that they must stop their car when the traffic signal shows a flashing red light. A flashing yellow light means that you are to slow your car to a safe and reasonable speed and proceed with caution. All traffic signal lights have a meaning, and the motorist must remember that traffic signals are placed at intersections to control conflicting movements of traffic. 